as Diana said, I'm JP. Uh, I'm you know sort of doing a bunch of work, different uh, things here in the city. Uh, one is my company, Wellcoin. Uh, I'm doing a lot of work over at Cornell Tech right now, and also some stuff over at Wild Cornell Medicine. I know this is not a heavily uh, health-focused group, and hopefully, a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about today has applications that you know are sort of beyond health. It just so happens that all of the stuff that I work on is in the health domain. So I'll start out with a couple of questions here, um, just to sort of frame the way that uh, that you might want to think about what I'm talking about. Um, th these are things that I get asked sometimes. It's you know questions that frame a lot of the bigger picture work that we do. So one is you know why can't technology help patients to remember to take their meds? You can insert almost anything under you know this take your meds portion, uh, but I, I like to cite that one specifically because it's something that is seemingly so easy, so easily you know, habit forming, yet people just don't do it, right? Even though you're going to, it's going to save your life to take these meds, people just don't do it. The second is, is a little bit different, and, and I'll get to why I'm, you know, sort of doing things that are on complete opposite ends of the spectrum here in a second. But, you know, where is this dominant iconic uh, technology company in the consumer health space? Why is there no Facebook or Google um, of consumer health, right? There's so many people in this country and worldwide that are focused on health, healthy living. You know, there's yoga studios popping up on every corner, fitness crazes everywhere, but there's not one or two or three dominant companies in this space. Now, for both these questions, there's all kinds of different uh, responses that you can give. And, you know, if you're a venture capitalist, you might have one answer. If you're a researcher, you'll have another. But in my view, uh, you know, sort of my, my biased view based on my research and interests is that a lot of this has to do with the fact that it's really difficult to engage people uh, with technologies around their health and particularly to sustain that engagement over long periods of time. So just some quick background. Um, yeah, I, we don't need to delve into stuff too far beyond my bio, uh, but I've bounced back and forth between industry and academia for quite some time now. And the majority of the time I've been working on problems that relate to getting people to use systems uh, over long periods of time and help them understand mostly data in those systems or collect data from individuals into the system to be used, right? So I've worked on a bunch of different projects, uh, some of which I'll talk about um, in depth as we go on, some of them I won't. Um, right now, I'm doing a bunch of work with the small data lab at Cornell Tech, which um, it, I assume Diana hasn't told everybody about, so the really brief spiel is we're interested in digital traces uh, that people that uh, people generate in their day-to-day -day lives using technology. It could be anything from uh, excited data from your phones to uh, the cable TV shows that you watch to things that we learn about you, from you, about you from your browser history, right? And so what can we do with those data when we give you the ownership of it, and then give you tools with which to do interesting things. And obviously, most of my focus on these kinds of apps are health, but there's some bigger picture stuff going on there as well. So next, just for a little context, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, my company, Wellcoin. So the idea behind Wellcoin was, is basically that you know it's the digital currency. You earn it when you do healthy things. You get to buy great stuff with that currency. And then you get to connect with some friends in a social sort of uh, a social sort of application. So when we started Wellcoin, we really had this idea that you could just like take all this great data coming off of people's a of people's uh, fitness trackers, APIs from grocery shopping, all of this kind of stuff, and you could just take that data in, turn it into this currency, and then let them buy rewards with it. Right? It seemed really simple. It was going to be a super quick turnaround, um, not turnaround to sell, but turnaround to get a product out and and get going. But it turned out that when we started testing this, nobody actually cared to use that. Right? It was really cool to do some stuff and to get some rewards, but you know, people would stop doing that for the first couple of rewards. The second big problem was that none of the people who were giving the rewards really cared if people went out and walked a bunch on their Fitbits. They wanted to be able to engage with them in lots of different ways. So you know, that led to a much deeper dive and uh, spending a lot more time on it than we'd intended. And you know, I, I think some pretty good things have come out of it. When you start using Wellcoin, you earn Wellcoins. I, I should, you know, if, in case people start a comment that we're mostly in Boston, anyone around the world can use Wellcoin if they want, but the best collection of rewards and whatnot are in Boston. Uh, second best is New York. Um, but anyway, so you earn well coins whenever you do something healthy. And we try to make a sort of a big picture, broad, inclusive view of what health is. So, you know, anything from helping your child be healthy to getting seven hours, the usual Fitbit tracking kind of stuff. 
Um, we wanted to be a little bit more inclusive than some of the, you know, some of the people who have tried these point systems based on just fitness trackers or apps that were just diet focused, that sort of thing. And so in order to accommodate that, we had to give you lots of different ways to record that you're earning well coins or lots of different ways to earn well coins. So, you know, there's sort of a simple self-report, right? You can say, yes, I did X, Y, Z activities and I want some well coins. If you do that, you get the tiniest amount of well coins because we can't prove that you did that. So, you know, you could essentially do anything you want. The next is we let you submit a photo um, or some kind of digital evidence that you did that activity. And that gets uploaded into the system. And then two anonymous community members have to vote on that as far as what kind of evidence or what kind of healthy behavior it is. And the better the voting that you receive, the higher the number of well coins for that. And then the last end of the spectrum is, you know, if you're using your Fitbit or we're uh, eating up your receipts from Fresh Direct or Instacart, no pun intended, um, then you earn the most well coins because that sort of stuff is really verifiable, right? So the next part of it is getting great stuff. Um, we have, we partner with uh, a lot of different sort of health and fitness focused companies and they provide gift cards, uh, samples, free things, all of those sorts of things into our marketplace. Um, diversity is really important. We have everything from gift cards to Target and Whole Foods to, you know, new, new, new to the market, uh, you know, sort of vitamin waters and things like that, headphones, uh, free classes at gyms, Pure Bar, all of those different kinds of things, pretty simple. And last, we ended up making a, a pretty significant uh, push into having a social component to Wellcoin. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more later, um, but you know, it was one of the things that we learned, particularly in talking to people early on, as well as our potential partners, is that if there wasn't some reason for people to actually get into the system and engage beyond just saying, I walked 10 minutes today, or I went to the gym, um, they, people really wouldn't come back into the system and spend time with it, right? They would do things, they might earn some things, but they wouldn't any time in the system. So essentially, that's Wellcoin. Um, we started uh, the company about three years ago. We spent a long time um, in beta and collecting data with a couple of our corporate wellness clients, mostly because if you start out like we did with a premise that one of the big problems in health applications is that there's no long-term engagement, you really can't be confident that you've built something that has long-term engagement in a three-month beta, right? So we spent quite a long time doing that and officially launched uh, our product summer in Boston with a sort of semi rollout in New York. And like I said, anybody can use it. Uh, we have, so we sort of have this kind of dual focus between consumers and between, um, and with corporate wellness programs. We have about 30,000 extremely active users in the system. Um, we're, one of the things that we pride ourselves in the most is that our engagement rates are outstanding. And we don't have, you know, sort of the fastest, the fastest download or uptake rates of any app in the system or any app out there. But uh, we are, you know, profitable in that, we make a you know sort of a good commission on the rewards that we sell, and we have a, you know a, a very highly active user base. Okay, so kind of getting into things now. One of the things that I get asked a lot, you know, as sort of this user user engagement researcher, is you know what actually is engagement, right? How do we measure it? What is it? Um, you know, anybody that you ask has several different answers for what this is. I mean, I assume everybody here is pretty familiar with concepts of user engagement. Has probably tried to measure it in different ways in different systems that you've used. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, there's depending on how you look at it, it can mean a lot of different things. But the the sort of definition or concept that I most gravitate to is that engagement has to be different for every different application or system that you're looking at. And it really is based on what it is that is the goals of your system and what are the kinds of things that people have to do in that system um, to, you know, to be effective in it or to make your system effective, right? So you could imagine that for something like the weather channel, right? So you look at weather services. Um, engagement with the weather service is probably that you log in you know, once a day, a couple times a week, or maybe when a storm is pending. But there's really not a whole lot else that you have to do in order to be engaged with something like that. For Wellcoin, the bar for engagement is quite a bit higher because we require that you're inputting a lot into the system, that you're purchasing rewards, and so on, right? So if you're, if you're simply logging activities on a Fitbit over time and not doing anything, there's lots of data coming into our system from you, but you're not actually particularly engaged. So it's kind of a, a, a dual thing there. Um, lots of people talk about engagement just in terms of sounds good, right? It's easy to kind of pick and choose the best of your various statistics and say, okay, our user base is really engaged, right? You know, you have 30% uh, retention rate over 90 days. That's outstanding. People log into your system once a day. We have, you know, gold star engagement, best in class. But if that actually doesn't accomplish anything for your service or system, those numbers are highly misleading. To get good engagement. There are lots of different reasons, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll quickly go through three here. 
Um, so the first is motivation. And truthfully, I just like to put this picture in nearly every presentation that I give. But so it's really hard to get people to do things, right? People just don't want to do things that they're not used to doing. And when it comes to health, that's even more so, right? Everybody who's tried to diet, who's tried to get up and start an exercise routine, you know how challenging that is, right? Motivation, huge number one barrier. Really short attention spans. And with health, I think we know that it's even, that our attention spans are even short, right? Because nothing is fun, everything's hard. And so we're always constantly seeking some new way of making things fun, right? So here I've got a few of my favorite examples. There's Jazzercise, the shake weight in the middle. If, if you're not familiar with it, it's worth going and finding some videos. It's pretty entertaining. But like, the fact is that people actually thought that that was something that would get them to work out and be in better shape. And then on the last, uh, a slight dig at uh, uh, you know, a company that was able to rack up, I think, the record for the most downloads in the App Store for a consumer health application, but just you know, several more than 10,000 active users. So the last of the barriers, the fact that you know, most of these actually require a substantial amount of interaction with um, in particular data entry or data processing understanding, right? So you know, you, uh, there's one slide that I sometimes put up that has this picture of a food diary from 1955 when the food diary was first created uh, for you know, sort of clinical research or nutritional research. And it was just, just big this big piece of paper with all these squares that you wrote things in. And then I showed you know, sort of to contrast Today, the gold standard is for your nutritional standard. actually work, right? It may be in your pocket and it happens on your phone, so it's always with you. And there's some, you know, there's some data stored in there so that you can, that maybe makes input process a little bit easier. But at the end of the day, it's still a really and cumbersome process that nobody wants to do. So we've gotten a lot better at it with things like Fitbits and whatnot. But, you know, very surprisingly, in some of the studies we've done with Fitbits, is that people actually lose and have, you know, extremely with Fitbits in these studies as if it were, you know, as if we were asking them to self-report. So just because something is passive, it may mean that you can get more data, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you can get more data over the over extended period. Okay, so for the next sort of while here, I'm just going to talk about a bunch of different uh, engagement tactics. And I'm going to give some examples. Uh, a, a bunch of them are from Wellcoin because I have uh, a lot of data to sort of support some of the stuff that we've tried. Uh, some of the stuff has worked. Some of the stuff has failed pretty miserably. Um, I at least think that it's pretty interesting. And, and, and well, you know, Wellcoin is a health site. Specific, the majority of this stuff is, is you know, not at all specific to health. I'll also talk uh, a little bit about a couple of examples from my research um, that are you know, at, least, at least somewhat different. And you know, we'll present them from the perspective of you know, how did we go about arriving at these tools and, and what can they be used for and these sorts of things. And the last, last little bit that uh, you know, Esther and I had talked about when I was talk is that you know, we thought something interesting to cover in this is uh, when you start looking at these health applications, the, the spectrum of, of people that participate in them or that are impacted by them is typically very narrow. And sometimes it's a choice by the designers of the application. Sometimes you know, it's, it's uh, not an intentional choice, but you know, indirect effects based on other choices that we're you know, making either consciously or not that result from that. But it starts to get really interesting when you consider you know, who, in, who in this country in particular needs the most help and who is actually using these kinds of apps. The time is, you know, if I were to read one book and understand what you do, OK, you know, this won't. Is a, it is a great book, particularly if you have a product sort of focus. Um, this book, Hick, Hooked, it goes through you know, this notion of triggers, actions, rewards, and investments. Go through the details, but uh, you know, I, I could certainly talk about it more if people like. But I do recommend going out and reading that if you have an interest in you know, figuring out how to build engaging applications. OK, so now we're just going to watch through a bunch of different uh, tactics that, that I've tried to use, uh, both in Wellcoin and in research, and you know, sort of how they fared in some of the and again, you know, if you want to push back on anything I say or ask questions, just feel free to go right ahead. So the first is rewards, right? And you think everybody wants free stuff, right? Everybody wants things. And you know, that turns out to be somewhat true. Um, we sign up a bunch of people to our website who are interested just in coming and getting a bunch of free stuff. Um, it turns out that you know, what motivates different people is quite different, right? So you know, there was a time in my life where I would have done a whole lot of things for a $10 Starbucks gift card. Uh, but maybe not so much right now. So there are some challenges in, you know, in, in curating a good uh, selection of rewards. One of the things that we find is that, is that people who come into the system, um, they often very quickly want a reward um, and get very discouraged if there's not a reward for them that they can get 
even if it's small, really early on. Uh, so one of the things that we've found that's important is to have very small and expensive rewards that make people feel like they've accomplished something really quickly to kind of get hooked into the system. Uh, but then likewise, there are a lot of people who are not motivated small quick rewards and sort of need a bigger payout, right? Longer term goals. And just getting small things over and over again isn't really going to sustain them. So you also need some, you know, sort of higher ticket, larger rewards in there as well. Um, the, the last little bit is, you know, sort of just in terms of, uh, you know, sort of who wants these different kinds of rewards and what kinds of rewards uh, our partners are willing to put into the system. Um, so this has had kind of the biggest impact on on uh, you know, what we're able to give out as free stuff and, and how people react to it is you know, which of our partners or you know, potential partners from all of the different sort of health and fitness focused companies out there are willing to put things into a system like this to attract new consumers. And you know, more importantly, what type of new consumers they're most interested in, in attracting, right? So one of the things that we were really excited about when we started Wellcoin was you know, it's going to be this virtual currency. It's going to give people buying power. You know, it's going to be kind of a great equalizer for people with lower SES in particular. But it turns out that you know, perhaps not surprisingly, Whole Foods doesn't want to market to lower SES people, right? So if you're not really careful about getting, getting uh, companies that are interested in marketing to those folks to put rewards into your store, you're you know, drastically limiting, limiting who can get your rewards. And it turns out to, you know, be one of these sort of the rich get richer kinds of problems that we see with a lot of other sharing economy kinds of companies. So the next hook that a lot of people try and use is social interaction, right? They use social of all different kinds, right? There's everything from micro interactions like likes to friending networks to all this different kinds of stuff. And we had this kind of idea that, um, you know, it was this gamble that we took. It was an idea that, you know, even though everybody hates, right? I, I don't know, I do. I assume everybody out here as well hates when you see that person who posts on Facebook, right? They're really good food every morning that they eat or like that, you know, they went for this five mile run and it was really fast and it makes you feel terrible about, your, terrible about yourself and nobody wants to see that, right? You go on Facebook, that's the last thing you want to see. But we had this idea that if you are specifically seeking out a health app and going into a health network or a, a, a healthy social network, that you might be more interested in, in seeing some of that content. So we built in you know, a Facebook or Twitter or however you want to put it, uh, like interface into the system so that if you want, uh, you can navigate and browse through other things that either your friends or anonymous folks in the communities are, um, might be doing. And it turned out that this was a huge success, right? So you know, we, we thought, okay, maybe some people will like it, some people won't. But unanimously, it's people's favorite feature of the site. And so you know, we have this, now we sort of have this internal dialogue that goes something like people come for the rewards, but then they end up staying for all of the social networking features. We have people who are using the system in Canada or the UK where there's not a single reward for them. Um, and they've been on the sites for uh, been on the site since we've uh, since we've started and are some of the most active users. Um, so in terms of some of the stuff that's worked well and some of the stuff that hasn't, um, so we give you kind of we give you a few tabs and you can choose how you want to see um, your social network. You can either choose to see you know kind of the fire hose, right? Like this is the public timeline, so you see all of the stuff that's um, you know that's going on on the site uh, as relevant to you as we can customize it to be. Um, or you can choose to see what your friends are doing only, or you can choose to just sort of see your own feed. And you know, you might think that most people just want to see what their friends are doing, but uh, when we started going and looking at some of the data, um, the vast majority of likes and micro interactions that we were seeing on the site were coming from people who are anonymous to the folks that they were doing it. So it's much like the Instagram effect of going to the sort of explore tab or following hashtags and finding other things that people are doing that are of, of, of interest to you. So some of the other stuff that we examine in terms of the social interaction, you know, really the, the best parts of the data are around these micro interactions and friend networks and things like that. Um, so you know, one of the things that we were looking at was how does this actually drive people to stay in the system, right? And so we were able to look at you know, the different types of, of people that were, or the different types of interactions that people received and the different numbers of friends that they had and those kinds of things. And so the number of friends on Wellcoin, if you have at least one friend on Wellcoin, you're much more likely to stay in the system than if you don't. But beyond that, it really is, is not particularly correlated, right? So having lots of friends doesn't seem to help, but it does help if you have some at all. The next thing that I think is pretty interesting is that if you have in your first week of being on the site, one activity that gets more than five likes, you're extremely likely to be in the system three months later, right? That's a very small interaction. You come into the system, you have one positive thing where you post something and five, you know, very likely anonymous to you if it happens in the first week. 
uh, you know, five people like one of these activities than you've done, and that has an extremely positive impact on the likelihood that you'll stick around in a system for a longer period of time. So, you know, you could do things to engineer the system to make it so people get more likes and those sorts of things. And, you know, we're not particularly looking into doing anything kind of nefarious along those lines. But, you know, there is some promotion of new people's posts into the, you know, into the beginning of the new feed, you know, all of that sort of stuff that you might expect one would do. Uh, leaderboards. So the next few activities that uh, the ne next few tactics that I'm going to talk about are all sort of you know fit under this uh, gamification um, kind of category here. Um, so leaderboards. You know everybody, particularly three four years ago, was extremely high on leaderboards. If you could quantify something, add points to it, you should stick a leaderboard on it, and that's going to motivate people to do something. Right? Steps in corporate wellness programs. All these things. Leaderboards, group competitions. You know this is this is the wave of the future and getting people to do whatever you want. Uh, but over the past couple years, if you actually start to dig down into the research about it, um, you don't see that that pans out quite so much. Um, what most of the studies have shown is this sort of, there, well, there may be actually an uptick um, in the mean performance of a group of people. So, you know, the, any individual is statistically more likely to have more steps or perform better on some of these simple activities if, uh, you know, if there are leaderboards and if they're in part of these competitions. But what actually happens is that there are certain sets of individuals that perform much more poorly um, when the leaderboards are present. And it's those that you know, are sort of dropping off out of the lead early on, and they just say, forget it. You know, we're not going to take part in this. And you know, obviously, so certainly we tried leaderboards in Wellcoin. Uh, they still are in the site, but we've actually you know, buried them considerably because of some of the experience that we had. Uh, but basically what we saw early on, so less than, fewer than 1% of people um, who had viewed their leaderboard ever went back to it a second time. So it was just something that was incredibly unpopular in our site. Um, there's, you know, you could explain that in some different ways. I mean, it could be that, um, you know, because of the well coin is a little bit more abstract than something concrete like a step, you know, it wasn't quite as clear to people what that meant. So maybe they didn't, you know, maybe they didn't feel as competitive over it. Um, it could be that, you know, we on Wellcoin tried to build sort of a, a feel and a branding that's very inclusive. Um, sort of more participatory than competitive. So maybe that's it, right? The type of people we're attracting aren't interested in that. Um, it, it's kind of hard to see. We started digging down into a little bit and doing some interviews. And the people who are using, um, who are using the leaderboards, you know, they found it every bit as motivating as their Fitbit leaderboard. So you know, we sort of discarded some of the stuff about the abstractness and the complexity of it. And the people that weren't using it, they kind of reaffirmed some of the stuff that we said. You know, it was, they're not coming to Wellcoin to compete with their friends, right? If they wanted to compete with their friends, their Fitbit, or you know, they would do it in other ways. But they're coming to Wellcoin to get ideas for new things to do, um, to get some support, it's to have a much more positive experience. The last thing that we noticed um, sort of you know, goes back and confirms some of the recent research that I mentioned, that the people who tend to go back and view their leaderboard most frequently are the people who are in the top two or three spots on, on their leaderboard. You know, that's not particularly surprising. And you know, we don't, if I had to hazard a guess, they would be in the top two, three spots on their leaderboard whether they went and checked it or not. Okay, so badges and bonuses. This is one that, uh, um, you know, they fit into sort of a, a few kinds of categories. You can, in some ways, um, layer in all of the things of leveling up, badges, bonuses, all of these things into one sort of conversation. Um, when we tried it, you know, we decided that we didn't want to do just kind of like meaningless badges, the badges to come with, or the the bonuses to come with a well coined bonus, right? So maybe it would be a little bit more motivating. We tried to make them interesting. Um, but uh, you know, in our case, they were just one unsuccessful. Um, a lot of people didn't even realize that they'd gotten them. It was like the least interesting item in their newsfeed, so they would just scroll through it, change the way that the badging looked, made it make it more obvious, send emails. People didn't like that because then it was intruding in their space. And you know, no matter how we tried, we just couldn't sort of figure out a frequency of them that made that made them uh, made a compelling case for them. Search around this kind of area has has demonstrated one kind of interesting paradox. Um, and and uh, Fitbit is something that kind of highlights this paradox pretty well, which is that if you give out the badges often enough for them to you know sort of be top of mind and potentially um, influence on somebody's behavior, they don't care about behavior. But if you give them out, if you give badges out infrequently, when people but to modify their behavior over longer periods of time to receive these badges. So that creates quite a challenge. And, and the Fitbit example I mentioned, so 
you know, the example here is you get these emails when you do things like, you know, walk your 4,000th mile, or you've now walked the circumference of the earth or something like this. And when you get one of these emails, you know, people resoundingly love these things. And yes, you know, I, I walked the circumference of the earth. Really exciting. It's not going to impact them because the next one of these emails that they receive probably won't be for another six months. Okay, so another, uh, an, another common technique that people use um, in, for engagement is just pure gameplay, right? And so this is often um, you know, used more as a direct interventionary tool or as a way of conveying information, uh, any of these kinds of things. So here I'm going to step out, uh, out of Wellcoin for a minute and talk about uh, a study that I did actually in my PhD program several years ago. And so we were working with, uh, does, ev does anyone know Brian Wansink and Mindless Eating, this book? Okay, so there's this concept of mindless eating and a, and a great book that was published by Brian Wansink up at Cornell University. And the idea is basically that, you know, there are little things that we can do to kind of engineer our food environment that make it so that we consume, you know, maybe 500 to 1,000 less calories over the course of a week without ever realizing that we're doing it and feeling like we're dieting, right? So it's things like taking smaller plates and keeping the, you know, the, the sort of buffet of food back in the kitchen rather than bring it out to the table so that you have to take trips back to the kitchen to get more food. Uh, there are certain shapes of glasses which make it so that you consume less alcohol than if there were other shapes, um, all sorts of things like this. Brian has done some really cool experiments, like uh, there's, there's one where he has people watch TV in a lab, and there's a soup bowl on a table that's filling from a tube underneath the table. And so people eat the soup, and the bowl just continues to refill. And so some, a bunch of people in this experiment would eat a few thousand calories worth of soup before realizing that the soup bowl was not actually draining because they were just engrossed in this TV show, right? So anyway, Brian was, uh, you know, has had some great success with, uh, with his diet and, and, you know, this sort of way of thinking in adults, but was looking for a way to kind of deliver some of these concepts to um, engineer the home for kids or even work directly with kids. And of course, the last thing a kid wants to hear is that you need to take a smaller plate to the table. So Brian was looking for different ways that we could come up with tips or, or deliver these tips in a way that the kids might be more receptive to. So we decided to get, uh, we decided to work with uh, this kind of concept of gameplay and in particular um, virtual pets, right? So Tamagotchi, Nintendogs, any of these things, right? They've all been super popular for, for, you know, for, for years and years now. And kids always resonate with these pets and, and tend to have good interactions and relationships with them. So the first thing that we did was we built this app and we needed a way of getting the kid to interact with their, pit, their pet. And so we would send them a tip, you know, something like eat a hot breakfast, right? If you eat a hot breakfast, it makes you more satiated. You tend not to snack or eat again until noon. So the, the tip, they might receive this tip of eat a hot breakfast. And then they would have to take a photo that showed that they ate this hot breakfast. It would get beamed up to our poor research associate, a research assistant in the lab who would, you know, look through all these photos and say, okay, yes, you ate that hot breakfast. And when they did that, the pet would immediately have a reaction of getting happy, sad, you know, more happy, more sad, depending on, you know, sort of the photo that was sent in or if the person had not sent in any photo at all. Uh, then over time, the more positive interactions that the or the more positive uh, response the kid had to the tips, um, they could you know, sort of bling out their pet. We unlock games that they could play with them, all sorts of different things like this. And so we did a study, uh, you know, a, a controlled study, and we found that, in fact, that, if you, that the kids that played with these pets did, in fact, uh, eat more healthier breakfasts over a similar time period than those that didn't. Uh, but just to kind of dig into a little bit, um, it actually really mattered how you engineered the game. So one of the systems that we tried was the was there was only positive experiences with the pet. So no matter how bad you were, you know, whether you didn't eat breakfast at all, your pet would never actually get sad or have any of these negative, negative reactions. But whenever you did something positive, you know, you submitted your hot oatmeal picture, uh, the pet would have a positive response. All right, this is something that, you know, was suggested to us that this might be a, a much better tactic than using, than using some negative psychology. But then it actually turned out that without that negative reinforcement, it was completely unbelievable as a game, right? If you do something bad, the pet should get sad. And if you're only rewarded for the positive things, it just didn't feel believable to the kids. And so those, the, the individuals in this sort of positive only condition actually perform much worse than even just our control group. So then we moved on a little bit. We thought, okay, this is great. Now let's, let's uh, get some peer influence going. Um, and so we moved up us just very ever so slightly in age group to middle school kids where, you know, sort of peer pressure and peer influence um, first starts to play a role. Um, we did a little bit of play testing. Kids of that age still enjoyed the game, so all of that was good. 
and then we, you know, sort of randomized kids into little groups that were anonymous. Um, but, you know, being kids, I'm sure they all figured out who they were, but at least they started out anonymous. And they would play the game, and we tested, you know, sort of kids playing in a social condition, where, as you can see, they could see six of their friends' pets on their screen at any time, or those who just kind of played in this individual condition, you know, the way it was before. And so the results came back, and the social condition was actually worse on average than playing in the individual condition. And when we dug into the data, it turned out that boys in the social condition um, performed significantly better than they had in, than those boys in the individual condition, right? They loved the competition, they got into it. But the young girls in our, in our study performed significantly worse. And it turned out that the reason was that the girls were not willing to submit pictures of something that they didn't feel was a really healthy and compliant uh, breakfast into the system, right? So they just weren't submitting the pop tarts. And in our system, you know, a no submission was just as bad as you know, or was actually even worse than a negative submission. So their pets would just get really, you know, sort of the the worst possible state, and then they would drop out of the game. So you know, it, it's just an example of with of how you know, if you don't sort of dive into the real details of these systems, you can build a game that you know on the surface seems appealing, like it might work for lots of different people, but you're just building in traits to it that are either excluding or making things a lot worse for certain portions of the population. Um, so another tactic people like to use uh, is giving. Um, members of your community or your site, the ability to kind of vote or rate on things, right? Thumbs up in activity feeds, um, you know, moderating uh, discussions, um, you know, letting people choose between different things and, and voting on them, right? This is a this is a proven tactic for improving um, for improving engagement with systems. And in Wellcoin, we had this kind of built-in opportunity to do it with people voting on the photos um, as they come into the system. So, you know, we, we were pretty confident, right? Everybody loves hot or not, or loved, you know, way back in the day, hot or not. Um, you know, everybody has this little bit of a voyeuristic streak in them, right? You look, like looking and seeing what other people are doing, and everybody has this little bit of a God complex where you like saying, no, you know, in fact, that is not the healthiest breakfast that you could have eaten right now. So we thought that it would be pretty good, but we actually had no idea for how, no idea how successful this was going to be. So the record number of photos verified by one person in one given day is now 3,800. And as, for, as best as I can tell, in order to verify 3,800 photos, you have to be in the system for about six hours doing nothing but clicking the rating button. Um, so, you know, this was fantastic, although we did get some complaints from one of our corporate wellness clients that one of their employees in particular, every time somebody went past their computer, they were just sort of sitting there voting on these photos. But nevertheless, <laughs> this, was, this was an incredibly uh, a popular feature, and it keeps people immensely engaged. So you know, we thought that it, it would probably be sort of a, you know, kind of a Wikipedia thing, right, where we have a very small portion of the population is doing all the verifying. And yes, there, it's a very, very small po portion of our user population, you know, less than 1% that's doing these ridiculous numbers. We call a ridiculous number more than 500 a day. Um, but there's a pretty huge distribution, uh, you know, uh, or sort of a wide distribution around, around the center, um, with the median being people verifying about 30 photos a day. Um, and so, you know, the majority of the people are coming to the system and they're spending a good 10 minutes a day, you know, verifying photos and looking at what other people are doing um, from a health perspective. And one of the things that uh, we actually find most exciting about this is not just that it's a way to get people engaged, make them feel like they're part of the system, but you could argue that getting people interacting with all of these different kinds of healthy behaviors and photos of, of healthy behaviors in the system and critically thinking about whether they should be rated, you know, how they should be rated on a scale is potentially doing a lot for people's, you know, sort of the way that they think about and frame their own healthy behaviors, right? We, uh, back uh, in, in my PhD program, we did a study with this application called Vera where we had people, you know, sort of go out and do healthy things and rate them on scales of minus three to plus three. And one of the and from my perspective, vast, the most vastly interesting thing that came out of this research was just finding the enormous discrepancies in terms of people's health perceptions on different activities, right? And so people would perceive that they were being extremely healthy, they would be very happy about it, you know, have really high self-efficacy, all of these kinds of things. But then when you looked into their data, they actually weren't doing things that were all that healthy compared to some of the other folks, right? So being able to kind of move that needle, right, make people understand where they're, where they're at in, a healthy, in the healthy spectrum could be really important for changing behavior. 
Okay, this is a big one now, right? Getting systems to automatically do things, right? We're just going to use all the APIs. We're going to suck in all your data. We're going to do X, Y, and Z, and you know, automatically, automatically, you'll get X, Y, and Z coming out the other end. So, you know, this was, like I said, this was kind of the founding premise of the company. This seemed like the best possible idea. But when, it, in our case, it turns out that when people in the system are using too many of these features, right? They're doing too much of their stuff in an automated fashion and not interacting with the system very much at all. Um, they just don't last as long in the system. And you could argue you know, that there's some bias there, right, based on who's likely to use the system in the first place. But we've looked at it over time and sort of how people interact with it. And we've had a couple of natural experiments that have formed um, you know, with sort of Fitbit, uh, our Fitbit connectivity stopped working for a while. Um, there was another instance where, or there's several instances where people buy Fitbits um, at some point or have Fitbits and then lose Fitbits. Um, and we can say you know, extremely confidently that if you're using one or more of these automatic services and not coming into the system and logging, you know, sort of self-logging one activity over the course of a day, even though your Wellcoin earning rate is really high from this, you know, from these automatic verifications, you're much less likely to come back and buy a reward uh, one month later and extremely unlikely to log into the site at all three months later um, than people who are, you know, sort of coming into the system and doing stuff. So, you know, it's, it's a little bit uh, dangerous to try and read into, you know, what this might mean more broadly, but uh, at least in our system and based on how we define engagement, again, as you know, we need people interacting with the system, um, this, you know, strictly automatic uh, parsing of data and bringing things in uh, turned out to be a negative rather than a positive for us. So I've said that, uh, you know, I've already said that lots of uh, these kinds of health tech systems rely a lot on user input. Um, so, you know, one of the things that people do is they try and kind of <clears throat> engineer and, opti and optimize that user input process. Reducing friction, always a good thing for increasing engagement, particularly early on. So we spent a lot of time, a, a huge inordinate amount of time, trying to optimize the input process for people putting, you know, getting their healthy activities into Wellcoin. And so, you know, you can see kind of uh, over on the, the far, uh, your right side there, you know, there's a, there's a to potentially put in their photo, what the activity was, the time of day. They can tag friends, they can share on social media, things can be private or not. Them verified. That's a lot of stuff, right? The, and, you know, if the person had to input all of those data all of the time, that would be, you know, you would assume too arduous and people wouldn't do it. So we do all of the usual, you know, possibly can to remove some of that burden. Um, and we've experimented with everything from, you know, reducing the process to nothing other than what is the activity and submit a picture to things with far more options. And what it actually turns out in our case is that there's sort of an optimum level of optionality that you can provide someone. Um, if you don't give someone options like the time of day um, or, or some of these other things, they actually get a little bit antsy, right? Because they're recording their, their lunch um, in the evening, maybe, because they just took photos over the course of the day and they're recording everything when they sit down in the evening. And they didn't like that it was like an improper record of, of how things had been done. Um, we, with the locations, um, so we, we thought early on that location would just be something cool and fun, and not a lot of people were using it, and we removed it, and those people that were using it got really up in arms that they could no longer tag their locations. Um, so when we did our redesign, we actually came out with, you know, sort of some tools to make location uh, more interesting and, and, uh, and useful. Um, but, you know, again, we, so we did these experiments, and we basically found that, you know, if we started, if we started removing options from, from this set of things, um, people were actually logging fewer activities, right? And as you increase the set of options, it was this it was this interesting spectrum. Whereas for sort of every option that you added on, people were filling out more and more of these options, right? So okay, there's new options. I can put that stuff into the system, but there was almost a a feeling of obligation in the real detail detail oriented folks to fill out all the options, right? It's like if they were on the screen and they were unfilled, then this one specific set of people would just no longer. Um, would, was no longer able to, you know, not record any options, and that would just lead to them dropping out and not and not filling out any of these forms anymore. So there's a big, you know, there, so it's a big task to sort of find for your system what that optim, optimum or optimal number of options are, or the way that you present those options to people in ways that you know sort of make them understand that they do or do not need to fill these out. Okay, so I'll jump out of Wellcoin again um, and talk about another of uh, my research projects. So, 
you know, a lot of the work that I've done um, in academia has been around this problem of um, trying to improve the user input process. So taking things where it's really difficult to collect data from them, from someone, and making it easier, making it more intuitive, making the data that we can collect maybe more reliable. Um, and self-report is a great uh, is a great place to work on this because you know so self-report has sort of this bad reputation in places the dirty word you know it's unreliable people have you know poor memories EMA is too invasive you know all these there's all these things that are you know sort of stuck around self-report that make it something that a lot of researchers and clinicians are just unwilling to use uh, in their patient populations. So how can we make this stuff better? Um, this one specific example I'm going to talk about. Uh, is in the area of measuring emotional state, or what we call affect, which is you know how we feel and experience emotion. Uh, so it came out of a project where um, we were working with a couple of clinicians who had patients of uh, cancer survivors, breast cancer survivors, and they were interested in measuring the emotional state and quality of life of these patients over time. And the way that you would do that is with this 20-item questionnaire that no one wants to fill out more than once every six months, right? It's, it's just not fun to fill out these long form questionnaires. But we know from lots of different research that it's not, you know, sort of how things, how you're feeling over the course of six months or how you remember you were feeling four and a half months ago that impact your health. It's how you're feeling moment to moment or day to day, right? And so as intuitive that, as that is, we didn't have good ways to do any kinds of assessments uh, along those lines. So we wanted to try and find a way to turn this, you know, long, boring 20 item questionnaire into something that people could fill out in just a couple of seconds and that was on their mobile phones or on their computer at work. <coughs> we tried lots of different uh, constructs. You know, there was some really cool work out of CMU, something called Mood Jam, where people were choosing colors that represented how they feel. Uh, people really liked that system. It was cool. But color is a little bit too abstract, right? It was difficult to tell what some of those individual colors meant. There was too much uh, flex uh, interpretive flexibility there. Um, you know, some people were using smiley faces, and smiley faces, you know, that seems really easy. Everybody can kind of relate to smileys, particularly nowadays. But, you know, the smileys are only, you know, only so emotive, and people ha also have some interpretation issues with those as well. Um, we try to do some stuff with, uh, you know, some uh, text inference based on, you know, sort of things that people are typing in their emails and whatnot. But typically, the kinds of conversation that we have over the course of the day are too short um, for the linguistic tools that, we, that are available to us to make good inference about um, people's emotional state from those. So we really decided that we needed to go back to self-report and we needed to find a, a good construct. And the one that we chose ended up settling on was images, right? So images kind of fit this nice niche between, you know, there's some flexibility in how you might interpret an image based on some personal experiences. So, you know, maybe it has enough meaning that you can always find an image that represents the way you feel. You can sort of hone in on what is. So rather than just kind of finding some images and sticking out there, being a, uh, an information science program, wanted to go out and do this the cool way. Went to Instagram and sorry to Flickr and the uh, Flickr API on the Creative Commons licensed images. Downloaded 36,000 images that had been tagged by more than one person in the Flickr system with one of these, you know, 36 known emotion words. Right. So imagine a thousand pictures downloaded that were tagged with the word happy by the community. Right. The idea being that if people had tagged them, they probably represent that emotional state. <coughs> so then we took that set. Was, uh, had you know some again some poor research assistant come and preen all of the images that were uh, inappropriate and there are a lot when you start talking about emotion words there's one word that you can't get away with and not having in your system that is uh, arousal and you can imagine 190 of those images were inappropriate and we had to go back and find more um, so you know so there was there was a process there and so we then ended up with several thousand images but you know again we needed to kind of dig in a little bit more and find out which ones um, not only might represent these um, emotions to the Flickr community, but really resonated with people. So as kind of an interim step, we built uh, this tool that uh, we, you know, sort of gave out to a bunch of people and asked them, okay, you know, here's, here's a whole bunch of images. You can just sort of scroll, you know, like, the, like your Instagram um, Explorer tab. You can just scroll forever on images. Find the one that represents how you're feeling right now and just click on it, right? And that was it. And so we had a couple of, we had to, uh, uh, a couple of weeks of you know, 30, 40 people doing that, and we did that a couple of times, and then we narrowed it down to a set of about 1,000 images that people had selected repeatedly over you know, the course of these experiments um, to represent how they feel. So at that point, we took these images, and we took the, the words, the emotion words that we've been tagged with, and we you know, crunched them down into this grid of 16 images that you see there showed on the screen at, at a time, 
Um, the placement in the grid is reflective of, you know, kind of the emotional uh, meaning of those images. And we then set up this experiment to see if, okay, can we understand when somebody taps, you know, this image here, that the ex emotion that they're experiencing represents fear and that it represents something that has, you know, a, a certain score on one of these emotional assessment tests. And so we performed a couple of experiments, basically people, you know, doing these gold standard assessments, then filling out how they feel. And we're able to conclude that the time it was around uh, just over sort of a 0.7 correlation. Um, so very strong correlation between the, the response that the people were recording here and what they're recording on the gold standard uh, forms. Then we also did a couple of a couple more tests, right? One was we stuck people in a lab and what and made them subjected them to videos, which you know psychologists have used over and over again over the years to induce certain kinds of affect. So you watch the sad video and then you're assessed with this, and you know you're more likely to choose the sad the sad faces. So in the end, what we you know what sort of emerged is this tool here that uh, you know with just one tap we're able to to understand the same thing about your emotional state than we could if you had filled out a 20 questionnaire. Uh, this is, it's now, you know, sort of free open source. Anybody's welcome to download it, use it in projects, those kinds of things. Um, to my knowledge, uh, about 50 different people have been assessed with this over the last couple of years since it's been released. Um, it's in five or six or sort of like placing it uh, uh, in your login screen for your workstation, right? So it's just username, password, and instead of typing, you know, the enter button, you click the emotion, the image that represents how you feel. Um, so, you know, it's had a bunch of success, not because I think it's, you know, the tool, because it reflects that, you know, kind of deconstructing something that's long and boring and tedious more frequently. And I think there's just uh, two more here, so we're but, uh, you know, but at the end of the day, people are using hundreds of different applications, and, and you know, many people find that the most exciting application for them is something that's really nearly a one-off, and, and nearly no one is using. Okay. And you know, there's just simply no way that you can go and build all those things into your system. Um, but we, where we really lucked out was that this, this method that we had of you know, letting people submit pictures from their phone up into the system to verify made it so that people ended up, you know, they just sort of co-opted this into a way that they could take screenshots of whatever, whatever app that they were using and upload it into our system. Um, and, and so because of this, there's now, you know, on a daily basis, I think it's approximately 10% of the photos that get uploaded into the system are actually screenshots from the various apps that people use, right? So what's really good about this is that it means that, you know, okay, so as long as you keep using Wellcoin, right, we don't care whether you're a runkeeper diehard or, you know, Fitbit is where it's at for you. If you change your mind and switch over to a new app or, you know, every day you're using new applications, uh, as long as you can continue to upload that data in a way that gets you these, this full verification, uh, that seems to work out pretty well for us. Uh, it, it kind of uh, is support for something interesting that... Uh, I once heard in a, in a talk by Bonnie Spring out at Northwestern, which was that in one of the very first um, health tech related trials that they did, clinical trials that they did, so they had this application and people would download it and it was you know, diet and exercise and do, or, uh, intervention. And people would download, th download this thing, they'd start using it. And when they started looking at the data, it turned out that nearly all of the participants discarded the app and never used it again after about two weeks, right? And in a six month intervention in a clinical trial, that's a huge failure. But when they went back and looked at the data and did follow-up interviews, it turned out that uh, the, larger, the large majority of the people who were in the, in the intervention arm and had this app, although they discarded the app that uh, was provided to them, they were more likely to go and subsequently download some other app from the app store that was a diet and exercise intervention, right? So the idea being that if you can convince somebody to get over this, this threshold of you need to use a diet app or a fitness app or whatever it might be, then you probably have done some good anyway. That, that's really bad news if you're an app designer and you want to you know, sort of get your app out there and have people using it. But if you're interested in making people generally healthier or doing interventions, it's really powerful to know that as long as you can sort of find ways to build that into your intervention. OK, the last one I'm going to talk about here um, is just this sort of you know, concept that we can use great design to sort of solve lots of problems and make lots of systems better and make them more engaging. Um, you know, I, I don't remotely disagree with the majority of that, um, but there is increasing evidence, not just from me, but, but uh, from some work of others, 
that great design is not necessarily uh, consistent with long-term engagement. Right? So there was, a, there was a report that came out uh, from Nielsen fairly recently that basically scored apps on their visual appeal uh, in the app stores, uh, both, both uh, Apple and Android, and then on sort of the, the duration of time out for when people rated them, um, which you know, sort of gives you an idea of, of the retention rates. And retention rate was negatively correlated with or inversely correlated with the visual appeal of the apps, right? So essentially, the better looking your app, the less likely it is that someone will be using it a long time from now. And you know, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but we had the exact same experience, right? So we had, um, I'm you know, loath to show this because it's so disgusting if you're you know, put off by gross color combinations, avert your eyes, but this is what our website looked like before. Um, and then we <laughs> worked with uh, a, a, our, our good friends uh, over at Free Association in Brooklyn who do fantastic uh, brand and design work. Um, to you know, do a, a, a vastly needed redesign when it came time to actually launch our app. And what we saw was that, well, the number of downloads and you know, the sort of conversion rate right from home page to first use, first use to second use, was dramatically higher than it was before. Our long-term retention actually started to go down. Uh, and by long-term, in this case, I just mean like second or third use to fourth or fifth use. Um, and one of the hypotheses is basically just that people are more likely to download something that looks great, right? So you're not getting people who are interested in, you know, who are really truly interested in your, what you're doing. They're just downloading something because it looks great and it's eye candy. Um, another way of looking at it is, you know, something that we certainly found with our old application, um, which was, it was relatively well um, designed from a UX perspective, terribly from, terribly, terribly from an aesthetics perspective, but relatively well from a UX perspective, but it still had too much bloat. You know, there were lots of problems. But once people sort of figure it out and committed to it, right, there's a certain amount of investment that goes into learning systems that are a little bit more complicated, that aren't designed quite as well. And this is one of the concepts that comes out of uh, IL's book, Hooked, that if you can get people to invest in something, they're much more likely to stick around over the long term. So I'm certainly not advocating poor design. I'm not advocating by any means that anyone ever has a site that looks like this. But you know, it's worth thinking about your long-term engagement. Um, when you're considering you know, sort of the amount of effort that you're putting into design and, and where you're spending your money in development. You know, so quickly, what did we find out that works? Um, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, um, the conclusion that we really came to was that you need diversity of all kinds to retain a lot of different kind of people in a system. And it seems you know, sort of obvious when you think about it, but what it really comes back to is that when you're considering someone who's interested in changing their health state or becoming more knowledgeable about something, or committing to some kind of program, you know, you, on the one hand, any given individual is going to be motivated by something very different from other individuals, right? Some of us might be vo very motivated by rewards and monetary things. Others of us in particular might be motivated by more social influences, uh, and so on. But then, you know, it, it's worse than that, because not only do you have to choose which portion of the population you're going to go after, um, with your app if you're you know, sort of using one specific technique. But any given person is a moving target in terms of what motivates them, depending on where they're at in terms of their stages of change or you know, sort of whichever model of behavior change you ascribe to, uh, you know, it, people w want different things. So you know, like I said, that $10 Starbucks that mo gift card that might have motivated me a few years ago uh, wouldn't do so much for me anymore. So you can imagine people coming into a system being highly motivated, and then you know your single, you know your sort of single-purpose system no longer being able to um, engage and, and interest those people. So it's it's this double-edged sword of not only is the population very narrow, but you know your window to capture people becomes narrower as well. So you know why is that so hard? Why can't we just build systems that have you know every form of of uh, you know these these highly engaging tactics built into them? Um, we've certainly built and tried to put a lot of them into the system. Um, you know, there are there are other apps and, and systems that have been out there for a long time that certainly um, do a good job with lots of these things. But you know, when you're first starting an app, whether you're doing a behavioral intervention that's funded, you know, sort of locally or by the government, or whether you're doing a startup, you know, why is it so hard to do all these things? And one of the reasons, you know, is just the obvious bloat that it requires to build all this stuff, right? A system that has all of these different kinds of features and engagement tactics built in is not a streamlined system, simple system at all, right? 
And we all know the trend today is for very streamlined, simple systems that can get people hooked immediately and give them sort of single use, right? So how do you build something that's the antithesis of that? Um, you know, there's a challenge there. The second is money, right? Building all that stuff costs money, and we're in an age where building apps and new companies and running interventions should be extremely inexpensive. So that's something to overcome. And then the last little bit here is, you know, what I call the establishments. Um, you know, I wasn't quite uh, cheeky enough to call them the man or something like that, but, you know, essentially I'm talking about, uh, you know, looking at, on one hand, you have the startup ecosystem if you're trying to start a company, and on the other hand, you have sort of this health re research establishment if you're trying to do, um, you know, a health intervention. And there's all these things built in and, and put into place in these systems which make it really difficult uh, to actually, you know, do a, to, to build an app or a system um, that's kind of broadly engaging and inclusive, right? So in, in the startup ecosystem, just really quickly kind of going through these, right? Um, I, I don't know if anybody, uh, if anybody was, you know, ever tried to start a company sort of back in the dot-com era, right? Everybody then was talking about this, well, where does your company fit on the feature product business spectrum? And it was like this huge insult if your company wasn't a business, but, you know, they knocked you down and called you a product. And if they were, you know, went so far as to call you a feature, you might as well just sort of like pack up your bags and walk out of the meeting. But today, right, the vast majority of new apps that are coming out are what, you know, 10, 15 years ago would have been considered features, right? And this is because it's so easy and so quick to build them. And we now know that this is the best way to get people quickly into a system and, you know, build up large numbers of users and sell it off to a company who's willing to buy that, you know, that set of eyeballs or that cool new technology to incorporate into theirs. Uh, another change has been this sort of shift from the minimum viable product to the minimum lovable product, right? It's no longer enough to kind of put stuff out there that you know, has the minimum set of features or a good set of features. It also has to be really cool and look great uh, to get people interested. And you know, there's some other things, right? The sort of the need to hustle and work really quickly is sort of, again, you know, it, it, goes, it runs in the face of trying to build something that's long-term engaging or at least test it that way. And on the health research side of things, you, know, you have things like you know, in order to prove something is efficacious, you have to do these giant, controlled, these giant randomized controlled trials. Well, the prime problem with the traditional design of the RCT that you know, big drug companies or the NIH is willing to fund is that they're very inflexible. And so you build your app and then start this three-year trial, and you can't make significant changes to your app over the course of the trial. Well, we all know what happens when you can't iterate and adapt your technology over time, right? Uh, then there are you know, lots of other sorts of, of issues, but uh, I, I think I've kind of gone on long enough. So with that, I will stop. Thank you for listening, and please, questions, comments, concerns? Questions? Uh, thanks, JP. It's super interesting work. I wanted to ask about something that you sort of started to touch on um, when you were talking about flexibility, um, which is how you think about sort of the tension between, um, like, I guess, I really hate the word empowerment, but between, like, user empowerment and, like, all the steps that you guys have taken to try and, like, verify input, right? So, like, the idea that you have the community decide whether your breakfast was healthy enough, like, I understand why you would do that. But you could imagine, right, that like if health means something very different to each of us, which you touched on, right, like that really you wouldn't want. Don't take my picture. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Sorry, I just can't ask the question if I feel like you're taking my picture. Um, right, that you could imagine, right, that like healthy to me is very different than healthy to you, or or that you know people can come up with like you just like sneak the, Snicker, the Snickers bar out of the picture anyway. Like people come up mm -hmm. with ways around those techniques. So I'm curious, sort of, how you think about that tension and designing that. Yeah, so the way that we think about it in WellCoin is a little bit differently than I would think about it if I were, you know, working with my colleagues over at Weil on an, an, mm -hmm. an intervention where, you know, measurable changes in people's health, you know, with the, the emphasis on measurable um, were important, right? So in WellCoin, like, we kind of decided that, you know, since we're only, you know, since things are only positive, right? Like, like you said, the Snickers bars get pushed out, the Snickers bar gets pushed out, people are not posting, you know, the giant brownie that they ate at the end of the day and getting negative WellCoins or something, right? It's, it's all positive. You know, we can measure the overall number of positive things that somebody does over the course of the year and maybe say that they've improved year over year. Um, you know, we can use sort of outside metrics to see if they're being successful or not. But, you know, it, it, it was never going to be something that we could, you know, in system really understand how effective we were being in terms of changing people's health behavior. Um, so instead, we tried to think about it more in terms of, you know, enlightenment's not quite the right word, maybe awareness almost, right? So it's sort of 
the, using the system as a tool to get people to think more about the healthy choices that they make on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so kind of one of the things that we do is, you know, there, there are all these like really little, seemingly stupid and insignificant ways that you can earn well coins, like passing on the salt or choosing, you know, to drink water instead of soda, all these little tiny things, which almost everybody does at some court at some point during the day, right? So if you're a new user, you don't have to necessarily run five miles or eat a salad every day for lunch to earn well coins. But you know, if you get in the system and start using it and earning well coins with some of these ways, maybe you find you know, some of those others. Um, so you know, with that kind of getting more, more direct uh, to your question, um, we have a couple of techniques that we're using um, to kind of to try and uh, make the voting be a little bit um, more fair or at least um, reflective of what people might expect in terms of you know kind of general or more consensus um, health expectations. So you know we um, have you know voting histories for all these users over long periods of time and for lots of different users for um, you know certain specific activities. And you know we've learned that certain you know there are certain users who are just always going to vote something a five, right? That everything is healthy, it's quick, it's easy. Let's just let's just go, let's just go. And so users like that, their votes actually get um, thrown out, right? They still vote, they don't know it. So oh, shh. Oh, hopefully none of them watch this, but you know what? But their votes get thrown out, right? So and Sorry. yeah, no, please. Well, but you could imagine just like not verifying, right? Yeah. You could just imagine like that, right? You know, you post a picture and nobody looks at it, or you don't post a picture. Yep. And you just Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's very true. And so, in uh, in a health in a, an intervention app that we did, um, where people were taking pictures of some of the healthy things that were that they were doing, you know, years ago for research, we did sort of just that. Um, we had people self-rating their activities um, and not having anyone verify and vote on them. Um, you know, sort of we did that on the back end from a research perspective afterwards. Um, and one of the things that was sort of interesting was, you know, sort of how group norms changed over time, the kinds of things that people were posting and contributing to the system. Um, it, it gets really hard to give people a ton of flexibility when there's that social um, influence going on. You know, that's, you know, sort of group tends, groups tend to the mean uh, over time anyway, uh, which I think is, you know, sort of calls for having more of these, you know, sort of not closed networks, but, you know, seeing lots of people who are not necessarily your friends posting and that sort of stuff. Any other questions? Hi, thanks for a wonderful talk. Um, I'm just wondering, is, is the gender of the user self-reported? Mm -hmm. And I just saw an article about 56 different choices in Facebook, and I don't know, I was just wondering, like, does, when does gender come up in the conversation when you're designing? How important is it? Because you just talked about differences between boys and girls. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there are differences between men and women, too. And we're all socialized to be men and women, and people always want to know the gender, but I'd just like to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, part. sure. Um, so on WellCoin, uh, the, and, you know, the first... So we had, a, we had a, about a 10,000 active user um, beta that we ran for, you know, for about 18 months. Uh, and that was sort of prior to redesign and all of that. And so we, sort of, we tried to take as much of our, you know, as much as we could from that uh, when building the new system. And so over the course of that beta, and it hasn't changed since then, um, our system was, uh, was skewed about 70% female. Um, and so, you know, it's, so it's majority of females in there. Um, the largest age demographic among those females is 22 to 30. Um, and there's a greater than population mean of, uh, of those that have children. Um, so our, our, our largest demographic is, in fact, um, relatively young moms. Um, so, you know, knowing that uh, when we were building the system and, and sort of working with our designers and the brand team and trying to come up with, you know, the, everything from, you know, how do we present this to new users to, you know, how do we, you know, sort of have the, the feel in the system and on the inside, uh, that was a big consideration, right? And so we, you know, chose not to go with sort of like, you know, there's this like hero branding that Nike and a lot of these other companies use, right? Which is like pumping people up and making them feel good. Um, we wanted to stay a little bit for, you know, not get too far into the like, you know, the branding of this is purely communal and social because we still needed to have some sort of firmness around the fact that we had a currency and rewards and those kinds of things. And so, you know, what we settled on was something that, you know, we, we tried to make sort of in this space of trustworthy, um, compassionate and reasoned. 
um, but also you know, sort of inclusive and inviting, right? So that was, that was how we did it from a branding perspective. Um, and in terms of the usability perspective and or sort of UX design, um, really the biggest thing that I would say that we built into the system specifically based on gender and demographics was we um, kind of put more emphasis and more thought into the system around how people like to record activities that they're doing with their kids. Um, so we have activities that are specifically spending time with your child or helping your child be healthy. Um, we can allow people to create profiles for their kids in the system and tag them in posts and those sorts of things. Um, and as a result, I mean, one thing that I think is particularly interesting is there is a huge number, and you can sort of see on Wellcoin if you go into these, into the activity feeds, the public activity feeds for the activities with children, there's just a huge number of really cool posts with kids happening on a daily basis. Um, so, you know, that's, for the most part, that's how we thought about it, and that was, you know, the approach that we took related to that. Thanks. It seems like there's an assumption in these types of apps and programs that data will influence human behavior, which I think there's been some questions drawn about whether that's true with things like Fitbit. Mm -hmm. And it seems like also a lot of people's motivations for doing healthy things can be very individual, spiritual, health scares, and you know, things like that that aren't so much motivated by these metrics. So I was just wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I, so, uh, I actually tend to agree that, you know, just sort of this there, we have a lot of issues with this recording and data generated and sort of objectification of health and well-being, right? I, I, I have a problem with it. I'm not, you know, this is not my area, so I can't speak eloquently about it. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, this, this notion that just by simply recording things about our behavior and objectifying the number of steps that we take on a daily basis is sort of, you know, putting numbers and, and concepts around, you know, just our health and well-being that, you know, have, have never been there and, and maybe shouldn't be there, right, for, for some people or for all people, who knows. Um, so, you know, I mean, our approach to it in Wellcoin has been a little bit less about, you know, there are certainly the numbers, right, you know, if it's fitness, you have to achieve a certain number of, you know, steps or minutes of activity to turn a certain number of Wellcoins. Uh, but with a lot of the things we've tried to keep, you know, the the number of well coins is more associated with, you know, you can go buy rewards than it is with, you know, the sort of positive experience of being in the community and doing stuff with your peers um, and those kinds of things. Interestingly, when um, so there's this, you know, phenomenon when somebody posts something to the community and it gets a it gets a low rating, right? Their their photo of like their kid brushing their teeth at night gets like, you know, two out of five and they get fewer well coins. So when that happens. Nobody actually cares about the fact that they got fewer well coins, but people get really offended that somebody else out there, you know, sort of didn't feel like this activity that they posted proudly as something healthy was particularly healthy. So when stuff like that happens, there, there's sort of an interesting dialogue that, that happens that is away from, you know, it, it, may be, it may be founded around these numbers and metrics, but, you know, it actually steps back from the numbers and metrics and gets at something more interesting. Um, I, I, I wish I could, you know, say a lot more cool stuff about this topic because it's something I find fascinating, but you know, I just don't know. Excellent talk.